Good morning. Welcome to Gum Baptist Church. It's good to have everyone here this morning. Got a bulletin full of announcements, so you might want to pick one up on your way out if you don't have one already, because um, I am sure to miss something. Um, but a couple of things I do want to, I will point out, uh, men, just because you probably didn't know this because it was a little bit mixed up, I didn't. Our Bible study is this Tuesday at 6 a.m., uh, the donut shop, so uh, don't forget that. Uh, day. Penny's got to schedule to work again on on the 10th. I didn't realize that's pretty quick. That's just coming weekend, isn't it? All right, so if you, if you uh, are willing and able to uh, help with VBS, you can look around and see that that Penny has been hard at work already decorating. Um, so careful in this construction zone. Uh, there, you you could get injured. Um, no service tonight. We will not have our equipped class tonight. We'll start back next week. I'm assuming nothing gets in the way between now and then. So nothing, no service of any kind tonight. Um, Tomorrow is our first week of youth camp. Our kids are going this week. So if, if you are uh, going or have a, a youth that's going, be sure and be here at the church. 30, 145-ish. Um, some it said 130, but I see that it was already in the bulletin as 145. So uh, be here uh, on time. How about that? Uh, I'm sorry. Friday? Friday. Okay. Um, be in prayer for our youth, for the workers, uh, for everybody at camp. Uh, we'll have two weeks in a row. Like I said, this week our, our kids will be going. Um, next week, Tim will be preaching. Summit will be doing the music, helping with the music. So we've got two very involved weeks at church camp. So uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, men's breakfast. You're like, what? Do we still do that? No, but we're going to start in August. So go ahead and mark that down on your calendar, August the 14th. And if you uh, would like to help with that, if you would like to get up early in the morning and cook, um, see that young man right back there in the back in the sound booth? Michael, wave to the crowd. Um, we're, we're gonna, he's he's uh, in charge now, so um, help. If you, you want to help, get with him. I think that's all. I know there's some things I've missed. Um, hopefully it's not too important. Um, did you want to? Well, I know as we gather today and we, uh, we do recognize that it is July 4th and it is our country's birthday and we, we want to celebrate our freedoms. Um, but I want to, there may be some expectations of, of things that maybe you would expect us to do. Maybe we're, we're not going to do, and, and, and I want to explain why. I want to read this quote from uh, a very beloved pastor from many of you, uh, Adrian Rogers. And here's what Adrian Rogers said. He said, I don't want you to think that I'm un-American because you're looking at a red-blooded American patriot. But our job is not ultimately to save America. Our job is not to preserve our lifestyle or our freedoms. Oh, we must do that. God helping us, we will do that. But our main responsibility is to stand for Jesus Christ here and around the world and put our hope, our faith, our prayers in something that cannot fail, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That, friend, is our hope. That is the hope that is in me. And so as, as we gather this morning, uh, we continue to worship Christ. We continue to live for and seek to advance that kingdom because that kingdom is an eternal kingdom and nothing can stop that kingdom. When we are outside of the gathered worship body, and, and we're, we're, we're not coming to church tonight because uh, we want you to, be, to celebrate, and we want you to be thankful for what God has done in our country, uh, we want to, you to be praying for our country, be praying for our leaders, to be thankful for those who have served, and we want to express gratitude, uh, but, but Sunday mornings we worship Christ, uh, and we worship Him and Him alone and seek to advance that. There are millions, a vast majority of believers in our nation, or sorry, not in our nation, in the world, uh, do not have those freedoms. And they're gathering this morning to worship Christ. 
And so as we are the universal church and we're worshiping as they are worshiping, we're going to worship who they're worshiping, who, who we worship. We don't worship a country. We don't worship. We worship Christ. And we're thankful for his freedom that he's given us, which is freedom from our enslave, enslavement to our sins. And so I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to, to, to sing about the victory and the hope that we have in our resurrected Lord. Let me pray. Father, we are so, so blessed. Lord, we, we are blessed to be, to live in the country that we live in. We are blessed to have the freedoms that we have. But ultimately, Lord, we are blessed because of what your son, Jesus Christ, has done for us. We are blessed because for those of us who are put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed, we have been saved, we have, Lord, experienced the hope the salvation from our sin, from the wrath of God, from the torments of hell. So Lord, we stand here as, as men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are a part of your kingdom, who are a part of a, a kingdom that will not fail, that is advancing in the world, that has seen lives change, and this morning we pray that we can worship the God of that kingdom, a kingdom that is, that is universal, that is advancing in every continent of the globe. And we, so we, we pray for our persecuted brothers that are gathering this morning, Lord, that under fear of life, Reminded of a, a pastor in Swaziland, Africa, who this week was literally running for his life, looking back and seeing loved ones shot and killed. Lord, we praise you for our spiritual freedom that we have in Christ, freedom from our sin. Let us focus on that. Let us put our hope in that. Let us celebrate the victory that we have in Christ and Christ alone. Pray that this service brings glory and honor to your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship together this morning.
Father, we, we just love you so much. God, we are in awe of you this morning um, as we just remember uh, all that you've done, as we remember the cross, and as we remember your glory and your grace, God, and, and your holiness, the fact that you um, saved us, Lord. Just help us this morning to, um, and, and just throughout the remainder of our lives to be in awe of uh, your gospel, God. Um, this morning, I pray that you would uh, just open our eyes and our hearts to your word and to just understand what it is that you are saying to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, for leading us so well. It's good to see all of you here. I invite you to open your Bibles and turn to the book of Joshua. Joshua, we're going to be walking through the chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. And as, this, as Chuck mentioned earlier, uh, there's just a number of things that I would ask you to, to be praying for. Uh, to be praying for, for our, our church, especially, in, I mean, always be praying for our church. We appreciate any prayers, but especially over the coming weeks, uh, our, our youth that are going to youth camp, pray for Summit and Jolie as they lead them, uh, and, and for those youth that come and pray that, uh, that they would hear the gospel and that the Spirit would prick their hearts um, and that they would respond to that. Uh, and so we've got two weeks of that, and uh, I would definitely covet your prayers as I, as I have the opportunity of preaching the second week uh, and, and for Summit and Jolie as well as they will be leading in the music. And then also in, in uh, I guess, three weeks, right? Three weeks. Is we, we start three, three weeks from tonight, we start uh, VBS. And so um, that is always a, a lot of fun. Uh, and, and, and just getting to, to minister and engage with young kids, and it's exhausting too. So uh, be praying for, for energy, be praying uh, for these, these young ones that come, and uh, that they too would hear of the truths of the gospel. Um, so we're going to be in Joshua chapter 2. We are working our way through the book of Joshua, uh, and we find ourselves in what I'm sure is a very familiar passage, uh, but um, as always, God's uh, word is, there we go, never grows stale, uh, and there are new things to be seen and discovered uh, as we walk through. So if you found your place and you're willing and able, please stand in honor of reading God's word. We're just going to read verse 1. Chapter 2, book of Joshua, verse 1. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Let's pray. Father, uh, as we walk through this passage together, I pray that your spirit would enlighten our eyes, your spirit would open our hearts, that we would see the unexpected beauty of your gospel, that your grace can reach down and literally touch anyone on the planet, that nobody is too far gone to experience your steadfast love. So Lord, we pray for our hearts and our minds and our eyes to be opened to your beauty through this passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know, when I was younger, and still today, I just don't have as much time. I, I, I really enjoyed uh, watching certain movies, uh, and I have a, a lot of, you know, a section of movies that are kind of my favorite, but two, two kind of categories of movies that I especially found myself drawn to uh, was one, the spy movies, right? Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with Mission Impossible, Ethan Hunt, uh, and just, you know, what he is supposed to do is literally impossible, uh, and yet he always does it. Uh, or one of my favorites, Jason Bourne, uh, the whole world's against him, and, you know, he comes out 
uh, best, and, and you have James Bond, and just a number of movies in, in, in which there's just espionage, and all things take place, and, 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 and I'm just intrigued by that. I've always been intrigued by that. But the other kind of movie that I am drawn to is, is movies that are completely unpredictable, meaning there, there's some sort of twist in the movie that when you watch it for the first time, you just never see it coming, right? Like, not a Hallmark movie. Uh, every single Hallmark movie, you know exactly the plot of what's going to happen. I, I, I like movies that, that I'm like, whoa, that, didn't see that coming. So, so if I were to you know, just, just name a few, maybe some of you have seen these Beautiful Minds, Russell Crowe. Uh, I'm not going to spoil these because there's some big spoilers. Or there's a movie that's called The Prestige about these magicians. And, and, and you just watch these movies, and all of a sudden, at the end, you're just like, what? And your mind is, is blown. Well, what we have here in Joshua 2 is a story that has both of these elements. It is a spy story. that We, we read that in verse 1. Joshua secretly sends these spies to spy out in land. So it's a, a story of espionage. But what we're going to find out as we walk through this is that, is that it is completely unexpected. It is completely unexpected. And so, so the title that, I've, that I've, I've, I've given this is Unexpected Undertakings. Unexpected Undertakings. And, and, and the chapter 2 really kind of uh, continues to be an introduction of sorts for the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, we were really introduced to, to Joshua and the people of Joshua and what, what was going to happen and what God is telling them will happen. That, that they're gonna be, uh, the, the land is going to be given to Chapter 2 really is is an introduction to to Rahab and the people of the land, these Canaanites. It's an introduction to to the people who who live in the land who Israel will be conquering throughout the rest of the book. But this story is also quite surprising for for, for a number of different reasons and and, 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 uh, a number of different levels. Right? Because when you read Joshua, 20, or Joshua, 20, Joshua 2, you could say that from a narrative perspective, it, it's really unnecessary. Like, you don't really need to know Joshua chapter 2 to understand the overarching storyline of the book. It, it doesn't do a whole lot to advance the story. You, you could take chapter 2 out and still understand the main theme of the book, that God is giving his people rest in the land. Okay, great, there's this family that gets saved. Okay, what's the big deal? But the author wants us to know this story. It's one of the longest dialogues of a woman that we have in the scriptures. And it's a foreign woman at that with an interesting career choice, right? So there's a lot of things that go on that, 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 that's just really unexpected. And so we're going to walk through this together. And the first thing that we're going to see is that we have an unexpected mission, an unexpected mission. Let, let me read verse, the first part of verse 1 again. It says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, uh, just, you know, this is a very, I've heard one pastor call it a very unfortunate name because this is probably not the way it's supposed to be. I'm calling it Shittim because if I would say the other, you, you, you might be distracted the rest of the service, all right? So if you can see that, you're, you'll understand why I'm choosing to go with this way of saying it. Uh, and so, so but, we, but these spies are commanded by, by Joshua to go and, and spy out the land. And, and if, you're, if you're a Bible reader, this should sound familiar. This happened again, uh, or previously, in Numbers chapter 13. And what we saw in Numbers 13, that it was a complete disaster, right? That they send out, they send out 12 spies... And, and 10 come back with a very negative report, fearful of the land, and, and two come back with a positive account. And for that, perhaps that's why Joshua only sends two out this time and not 12. Uh, but if you're reading this and you're re- remembering the past, you're thinking, uh-oh, like, what's going to go wrong this time? And maybe you're thinking, Joshua, why are you even doing this? Like, why are we even, even, even tempted to do this again? Now, there's debate here. Is Joshua acting in faith, or is he acting in fear? Should he have sent the spies? He's already been told that the land will be given to them. What's the point of going and spying out the land? What more do they need to know? 
Yet never does the text say that Joshua is in the wrong. He's not judged for these actions. And so quite simply, we just don't know. But if you're asking me, I tend to lean that this is a moment where where Joshua is, he's got some growing to do. I I think there's things in the text that indicate that that Joshua is is not operating in just full faith at this moment. And what you will begin to notice about this chapter is that there are a whole lot of questions about what takes place that they're just not answered in the text. But I think there's a reason for this. And that reason is this. As the reader, you are meant to feel the tension within the text. There are things that happen throughout that kind of make you question. And part of that is is even seen in in who the primary character is, right? In chapter 2, there is one primary character and that that the spotlight kind of shines upon. One character who is shown to be really in control of the narrative, and it's not Joshua, it's not the spies, it's a Gentile Canaanite woman who's a prostitute. It's the only person who's named other than Joshua in the text. That usually indicates who who we're focusing on. And so we have this, this unexpected mission that immediately brings about some tension and uncertainty to our minds. Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? Two, we have an unexpected connection. An unexpected connection. Look again in the second half of verse 1. So then they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Now, now as you read about these spies and, and you read the whole story, you really begin to wonder how capable these guys are. Right? They end up in a questionable place. They are immediately found out, right? Like the king knows exactly who they are and why they are there. And really, when we get to the end of the story, they don't have any information to give Joshua about Jericho or the land. So, so, so if you're kind of comparing these guys to, to the previous spies in number 13, these two are really kind of far worse from an espionage standpoint. Those guys back then, they came back with a lot of information. They came back with fruit of the land. They came back with, with, with hey, these are big fortified cities. They came back with saying, there's giants in the land that we need to be fearful of. These guys don't come back with any of that. We'll see that at the end. So don't think of them, really. Don't think of these spies as as your Jason Bourne or your Ethan Hunt. Think of these guys as maybe more along uh, along the line of a guy like Johnny English. Remember him? I looked up. I actually haven't seen his movies, but I was kind of looking up like goofy spies just to see what was out there. Here was the subtitle to one of the English movies. It says, he has no fear. He has no danger. Or no, he knows no fear. He knows no danger. He knows nothing, (laughs) right? That's kind of what you get the idea of these, these spies, Now, some people have tried to argue that Rahab is not actually a prostitute. That they say that this word here in Hebrew can be used more as a a woman who runs a a tavern or a hotel type business. And so these guys are just kind of uh, of coming to to, to lodge for the night. Uh, And I guess that could be true, but here's two things. First, that's not the normal use of this word in the Old Testament. Normal use of the word is the word that is put there in our text. And then the second thing, which I think is the more convincing, is that Rahab comes up a few times in the New Testament. In fact, she is seen in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And in that passage, the author of Hebrews identifies her as a prostitute, which is the Greek, the Greek word there is, is porne. All right? so, so I'm going to side with the guy that was inspired by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament who thinks this woman's a prostitute. I'm going to go with that. All right? That this is, this is an accurate representative of, of who she is. But again, I think this is a part of the whole point of the story. Israel is going into a land that is filled with corruption, idolatry, and all kinds of sexual sin. So, so this is what we would expect of the people in the land. We would expect wickedness to to be prevalent among the people. We expect them to be engaged in wide-said sexual misconduct. So the story thus far, you could say, is really par to the course of what we would be expecting. But what we don't expect is what happens next in the story. Here's where the twist begins. So we have an unexpected action 
Look at verse 3, an unexpected action. It says, Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, hidden them. And she said, True, the, man, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Now, I, I realize that most of us here are very familiar with this story, right? We, we, we've known this story ever since the days of the flannel board days, right? The flannel board things, like I remember that. But it's important that, that we at least attempt to read this story as if we're, we're reading it for the first time, without knowledge of the end result and even of, of who we know Rahab to be at the end. Right now, she is just a Canaanite prostitute, and we would expect her to function as a Canaanite and for the Canaanites, that she would be on their side. So, so when you read this, you should be feeling the tension that exists in the story for our two beloved spies. The spies have come into the city. The city authorities, without any satellite imaging or, or phone tapping, find out exactly who these guys are and where they are. The authorities are coming to the door, pounding on it. The plan is about to end in absolute disaster. The only thing that is between the enemy authorities and these Jewish spies is a Canaanite prostitute. And the expectation is that she would immediately rat them out. That's what would be expected. Oh, yeah, here, here they are. Or, or maybe she's going to work an angle and say, well, what's in it for me if I tell them where you are? Like, that's what you would expect to find. And then, again, as every really good movie has, something completely unexpected happens. The woman takes the spies and hides them in a pile of flax on her roof. Right Now, now the irony within this story is, is really remarkable and rather hilarious. One commentator writes this. He says, the scene is almost humorous. The spies came to, to dig up information, but end up buried under piles of flax. They sought obscurity in Rahab's house, but end up in a high visible hiding place on the roof. And it is difficult to see the land, which is what they've been commanded to do, hiding under a rooftop pile of flax. All right, so nothing's really, really going right for these guys. So what we see is that the spies are completely in the hands of Rahab. Their lives are at the mercy of what she decides to do with them. And for whatever reason, remember, we're not, we're not supposed to know how it all turns out. Rahab flat out lies to the authorities. Now, she affirms that they were with her. Right, that goes along with what the king already knows. So she, she's not going to try and deny that. That would be foolish. In fact, in the way that she speaks and how the author writes about this whole situation, it's going to seem to affirm that these Canaanite authorities think. Right? And, and, and it's, it's hard to see this in our English channel. What, what, what do, the, what do these, these authorities think happened? They think these Jewish guys wanted some pleasure and came into the city and went into this prostitute and they've come out and they've left. That, that's, what they, that's what they think. And, and, and if you were to, to read this in, in Hebrew... You would immediately see that, that there's, there's this double entendre language within the text, meaning, meaning the language here can have a very innocent meaning, and it can have a very ra rather risque meaning. So, so, so this, this word for, for came or came into, which is used in verse 1, verse 2, verse 3, two times, and verse 4, can all simply mean come in, or it can have a more sexual connotation. The, the word lodged. In verse, used in verse 1 or verse 8, can have a, an understanding of, of laying down with or of simply you're going down to rest. But the word there for no that's in verse 4 and verse 5 can also have sexual connotations. You'd probably be more familiar with this word because in Genesis 4, 1, when, when Adam, it says of Adam, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. All right, so you have all this language that you're like, what, what exactly is, is going on here? So, 
So I don't think it's by accident that all of these words are used within the context of the story, right, of where they're located. So, so the question is why? Is the author saying that something took place that wasn't supposed to happen? No, I, I don't think so. I believe the author is setting us up for the big twist. He's describing the scenario in a way that one would expect when a prostitute is the main character. And this is what the men of Jericho think. They think that the spies of Israel have come to Rahab for sexual purposes. And Rahab is not going to try to change their minds in this situation. She goes along with what they suspect, and it's really the reason for why her lie is believable. Yeah, they came in here, they were with me, and then they left just in time to get out of the city before it's, it's closed. That kind of behavior is normal within the Canaanite city. These guys, okay, yeah, that's believable. And Rahab uses that for her, for her advantage. And the men of the city, they believe it, right? They take, they take the bait, hook, line, and sinker. They listen to the advice of Rahab. They immediately engage in an all-night goose chase that will come to nothing. But for our beloved spies, the tension is not over. Verse 7 says that the gate shuts. And that's not good. They are completely trapped in the city. And listen, we, we still don't know the motivation of Rahab. Like, yes, she hasn't ratted them out yet, but maybe she's got another angle she's playing. Maybe she's wanting to get something from them, and she thinks, man, these Israelites, I've heard about them. I know that they've plundered the Egyptians. They've got a lot of stuff, and I want that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this angle for a little bit and see what I can, what I can get. But she could quickly sell them out just as quickly as she had hidden them. And so the reader is left with this incredible tension. Here's these men locked up. The gates are shut. What's going to happen next? Is Rahab actually an ally, or is she just working for her own purposes? And then we come to the fourth scene, which is an unexpected declaration. Unexpected declaration. Now, now before I read it, I, I want to emphasize something here. If you were to, to structurally in the Hebrew, see this passage, you would find out that, that verses 8 through 14 are the heart of the passage. He's emphasizing all, all this other stuff. You've got all these questions, and I'm not going to fill you in on these answers, but you need to focus on these words that Rahab is about to say right here. It's the primary message of the entire chapter. It's almost as if he, he leaves you to, to this point. Like, okay, you, do, you don't have all these answers, but listen up. All those things don't matter. This matters. Look what it says, verse 8. It says, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, as, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. you know, reading that, you almost think maybe they would have jumped in singing, Behold our God at that point, right? That, that, that's what Rahab is declaring. This is a declaration of faith in Yahweh. And there's four things to note real quickly in her declaration. First, she has faith in what God will do. Right, look, look again at, at verse 9. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melts away before you. 
She knows that this land is going to the Israelites. She knows that God is going to be victorious. She knows what God will do in the future. And she declares that to him, to these spies. So she has faith in what God will do, but she also has faith in what God has done. Look at verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before when you came out of Egypt, and, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. All right, she, she, she's heard of what God did do. He brought them out of Egypt. He, he, he made the Egyptian gods look foolish. He parted the Red Sea, and all of Israel walked through unharmed, and then he brought judgment upon the, upon the Egyptians and buried them in the sea. So she has faith in what God has done in the past, what he has accomplished. So she has, she has an understanding of, of what he will accomplish, and she has an understanding of what he has accomplished. Thirdly, she has faith in God alone. Look what it finishes with in verse 11. She says, For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. She uses there the personal name of God, Yahweh. She says, the Lord your God, he is God. So, so by that declaration, she is, she is adhering to, to a view of monotheism, which is just completely foreign in her culture. They've got all these other gods that they, that they worship, Baal, Molech, all these other gods that, that, that her people worship. And she's saying, Yahweh, yeah, he's the true God. He's the God that's worthy of our worship. He is the one who is in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. In fact, there's, there's very few other people in the entire Bible, at least in the entire Old Testament, that make a declaration like that. Very few others. And because of that, the hearts of the people are, are, are melting. So she has faith in what God will do. She has faith in what God has done. She has faith in God alone. Fourthly, we see that she has faith in God's mercy. She has faith in God's mercy. Because look what she says, verse 12. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly, that, that word kindly is the word chesed, God's, God's steadfast, his, his covenant love, as he has dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brother and sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. She appeals to God's Mercy, his hesed, his never ending, never giving up, always and forever love. It's oftentimes translated steadfast love. She is pleading for the steadfast love of God to be shown to her and her family. Why? Because she has faith that even someone like her can receive the mercy of God. She trusts his mercy. So, with this declaration, Rahab, listen, is seen as a model Israelite. Like, this kind of person is who, who you need to be, guys. You know, remember what I, what I said when, when I, a few weeks ago when I did the intro sermon to Joshua? And I said, looking through the characters, and you have the people of God or the Israelites as a character. And what I said about that is that, that the, the people of God is not based on ethnic identity. The people of God is about one's declaration or allegiance or devotion to God. That's who are the people of God, who, who are devoted to God, who have faith in God. And I would say not only is she a model Israelite, she's a model for us. She's a model for us. If we claim to follow Christ, then Rahab's declaration must also be our declaration. And really, that's what we do when we come to, to faith in Christ, right? When we come to faith in Christ, we, we have a future understanding of what God will do. And what will he do? He will bring judgment. 
Like, that's what's coming. God's judgment upon the world for those who do not know him. He's going to conquer the world. He's going to recreate everything. That's going to happen. So then what do we do? We know the future. Then we look and remember what God has done in the past. And what has God done in the past? He sent his only son, Jesus, to die for us. He's defeated sin, death, and the grave. He's conquered it by his blood. And we, 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 affirm, we affirm that no other God can, can do that. Or, or, or nothing that you can do can accomplish that. Only God can do that. And then we appeal to God's mercy and his grace, his steadfast love in our life. Rahab's declaration is every one of our declaration who have put our faith in Christ. So we see this unexpected declaration. Fifthly, we see an unexpected salvation. An unexpected salvation. Let me read verses 15 through 21. It says, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills where the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and you shall gather into your house, your father and mother, your brothers and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window." So long as Rahab continues to align herself with the Lord and for the cause of the Lord, she will be saved. She will be saved. Now, real quick, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of people that, that see this, this scarlet cord that's cast down and, and they see that as, as, as typological or, or, or foreshadowing the blood of Christ that's poured down to us and, and to redeem us. Um, that it's possible some of the early church fathers believed that, had that view, uh, where nowhere in the New Testament is there a reference to that. What I do think this is a reference to is, is, is back to the Passover, right? Where they, they marked the door with, with, with the blood of the lamb. And so you could say, well, by pointing to the Passover, it's pointing forward to Jesus as well. That's, that's possible. But, but, but it's definitely pointing back to these people. Everyone who's going to be in here is going to be saved from the oncoming judgment. And what we, what we know and what we, or what we will see as we continue as this actually happens, Rahab's family is, is saved. She, she puts her, her faith in action. She does everything she's supposed to do. And if we want to turn over real quick just to kind of see the ending, because when we're going through uh, the passage on Jericho, we're, we won't spend a lot of time on her. But in, in Joshua 6, 25, listen to what it says. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So Rahab does not merely have an, an academic or an, an intellectual faith. She has, she has a faith that works. She has demonstrated that she truly believes in Yahweh by putting her faith in her actions and saving the spies. Trusting more in the Lord than in what might happen from her own people. And she is commended for this. If you go to the book of James, James chapter 2, in this section with this idea of faith without works is dead. James 2, 25. Let me just begin in 24. It says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? 
She is commended for her faith, for putting her faith in action. But, but, but there's more here. There's more here because Rahab's actions don't merely lead to her own salvation or, 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 or even only her family's salvation. They lead to our salvation as well. Now, now, maybe some of you are like, well, what do you mean by that, Tim? It's a great question. Thank you for asking. Go over to Matthew chapter 1. Many of you know, you knew this is where I was going. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1 is, is just one of our favorite things to read in the New Testament scriptures. It's a genealogy, right? We love the genealogy. Genealogies are great. But listen, this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, verse 5. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Rahab isn't just saved and brought into the people of Israel. Rahab is saved and brought into the line of redemption, into the line of the Messiah, into the line of Jesus Christ. And here's what's fascinating about Matthew's genealogy. There's only five women that are mentioned, only five. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, and Mary. That's it. Three out of five of those women are complete foreigners. And three out of five of those women have some very interesting stories and backgrounds. Like, go read Genesis 37 about what happens with Tamar, and you're like, what's going on here? This is very strange. Or, or we preached through, through Ruth a couple years back, and, and Ruth the Moabite, a foreign woman who, who comes from a family of idolaters, is brought into the family. And then we have, we have Rahab, who's the prostitute. These are stories that are giving us just little glimpses of God's ultimate intentions, which are what? His ultimate intention is that his glory would go out to the nations and then the nations would turn to God. That's what's being fulfilled on a small scale with Rahab. The glory of God has gone out to Rahab. She sees God. She beholds God. She understands who he is. And she, in turn, worships God and God alone. That's where the, the, the history of redemption is headed. That's where we are a part of it. We're going out to the nations, declaring his glory, praying that the nations would turn to God in worship. And so we have a very unexpected salvation. But sixthly, sixthly and lastly, in Joshua chapter 2, we have, an un, or we have expected information. Expected information. Look at verse 22. It says, They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days, until the pursuers returned, and the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing, went on this wild goose chase, nothing there. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Now listen, that, that sounds, that's not, man, that's some great information right there. But realize that's, that's, they don't bring back any new information. They already knew this. In fact, their declaration is what Moses declared over 40 years before. Listen to uh, the song of Moses in, in Exodus 15. Exodus 15, right after they, they come out of the Red Sea. And, and it's like you just put a pause on the whole story. And Moses declares this. Exodus 15, verse 14, it says, The peoples have heard, they tremble, pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. 
Now all the chiefs, now, now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by by whom you have purchased. This is old news. They already knew this. God had already told them these things. This is, there's no new information that these spies bring back. So here's what I think Joshua chapter 2 is doing. It's saying, hey, Israel, you need to be more like Rahab. You have all the necessary information you need. God has promised to give you the land. Trust him. If a Canaanite prostitute living in Jericho can trust him, so can you. So can you. So real quickly as we close, just, just four quick things to kind of take away from this passage. Four quick things to take away from this passage. First, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And we can see that in a couple different ways. One, and, and, and we can see this in, in just Rahab's declaration that he is, he is the ultimate God. He is the sovereign reigning king. So we see that specifically. But then just the entire story itself, right? Like of all the people that, that, that they, these guys would encounter in Joshua or in Jericho, it's this, this prostitute who is believing in Yahweh. Can't tell me this was a chance incident. So, so, so what you see is that, that God is, is sovereign on kind of over the cosmic level, the, the major storyline, but he's also sovereign in the details. God is sovereign. Secondly, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And this is a repetitive theme that's, that's just kind of carried throughout the entire scriptures. Right? When Adam and Eve eat the fruit, we know judgment's coming. When Israel worships at the golden calf, you know judgment is coming. When, when Israel worships false gods in the land, which they will do in the future, judgment is going to come. And that's what the prophets are declaring throughout all the prophets. Judgment's coming. Return. Repent. Judgment is going to be cast on the nations. Now, I'm reminded of, of, of uh, the book of Jonah, right? Jonah, the, the prophet of the Lord who, 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 who God calls up and says, hey, go, 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 go preach to Nineveh that my judgment is coming. And, and you know the story. We're not going to get into the story there. But that, that's, he's telling them judgment is coming. Listen, our world right now where we exist, judgment will one day come. Judgment will one day come. God, the Bible says, is, is forbearing. He's He's patient. He's patiently allowing the gospel to go out so that his people might repent and turn to him. And so God is showing himself merciful, which leads to the third application or takeaway is this. Salvation is here. Salvation is here. We don't stand in a judgment with, with, with nothing, with nowhere to turn. Yes, his judgment is coming, but he's made a way out of the judgment through Jesus Christ. Jesus has come. Jesus has, has, has God has laid on Jesus his wrath on our behalf. He paid for our sins. He died the death that we deserve to die so that through faith, we might now be made the righteousness of God. And that leads to our last thing. A response is necessary. A response is necessary. Rahab didn't just sit back and do nothing with the information that she had believed about God. When she's hearing about what God is doing through Israel, when she's hearing about what God will do in the land, and she's given this opportunity to, to side with Israel, she takes it and she puts her faith in action. She believes. That's what we're called to do. You have the knowledge. 
You have the understanding. You, you, from God's word, you know that judgment will one day come. You know that Jesus has, has, has faced God's judgment on, on our behalf. But just knowing that doesn't save you. James 2, that chapter that we read from earlier, it says even the demons believe that. I've heard it put this way. Demons have, have better theology than I do. They have a better understanding of who God is and what he is capable of, yet they, re- they refuse to submit. They refuse to, su- to respond to him. Instead, they rebel. So the question is, will you respond? What is your response? Have you responded to the gospel? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this glorious passage. This passage that reveals to us so many things about who you are. Reveals your glory reveals your sovereignty, reveals your faithfulness and your mercy and your love. I pray that we would be a people like Rahab. That we would be a people who have an understanding of what you will do and understanding of what you have done and that we would respond to that in repentance and faith in action, Lord. Help us, God. Help us to trust you. Help us to to put our allegiance and our devotion in you and for you. As we close our services, we move to a time of of invitation. And the invitation is simply to respond to the gospel. Whether you have come to an understanding that you are lost, that you are still in a position where you would face God's judgment upon your life, then the response to you is to believe in who God is has revealed himself to be, believe in who Jesus is and what he has done. And to seek to live your life for him. To have your life transformed by the gospel of his grace. That it is nothing that you can do to earn a right standing before God. that, that, That your salvation has been accomplished by Christ and Christ alone. I pray that you would believe that and that the Spirit would convict you of your sins and draw you to him. For us, those of us who are believers, I think we can easily identify with the people of Israel, a people who, who, who had God's plan before them, a people who knew and who had seen who God is, but were still at times just a little bit timid Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit into our lives, convict us of our apathy, of our timidity, and fuel a flame the work of your gospel in our lives, that we would be fighting sin, that we would be pushing back darkness with advancing the cause of Christ in the nations. So as we stand and sing in a few moments, I invite you to respond. However you feel the Spirit is leading you to respond, I'll be down here if you would like to come and talk. If you'd like to come and pray, the altar is open. But you don't leave here without responding to what the Lord is calling and asking you to do right now in your life. Let's stand and sing together.
Uh, let me just say it is so encouraging to know that God is working in the midst of people. Um, you know, it's, the Lord is doing things in people's lives. Uh, next week, a, a couple will come before you and be baptized, and so be here. It's a, just an exciting time. Uh, and and uh, Ben and Jennifer, well, ben, Ben's a member, member, but Jennifer has expressed her desire to join with our church. She's going to go through our little class that we have and come before you uh, to become a member. Uh, and so it's just encouraging. It's encouraging to me. Uh, I pray it's encouraging to you. And so just uh, love our people. Uh, be excited about what the Lord is doing in their midst. Um, and so I, I just want to close uh, with reading Psalm 2. Psalm 2, uh, which when thinking about Joshua and thinking about uh, these, these nations that rage against uh, the one and only king, listen to what the psalmist declares. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against the, his anointed. And they say, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hills, talking about Christ. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, submit to the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. As you go this morning, this, this evening, whatever we are, this afternoon, uh, go in the refuge that you have in Christ. You are dismissed.